So this morning, um, I've been asked as part of the Back to Basics series to talk about the subject of repentance. Okay. <laughs> this is going to be a slow work this morning. The subject of repentance. A very big, thank you, a very big subject, a very complex subject. And you sometimes we just think about it as a one-off subject. You know, you become a Christian, you repent, you turn away, you step forward into things of God. And that is true. And we're going to touch on that very briefly towards the end of what I shared this morning. But actually, I'd like to bring it more into what repentance means to us who are already Christians, us who are already walking with God. Now, will you do me a favor? See, no one says yes until you know what it is, right? Will you do me a favor? Okay. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. That that wasn't too complicated, was it? You feel okay now, don't you? You feel quite safe. So are you ready? Together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread as we forgive them. Stop, 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 stop. What was that sentence? Give us our daily bread as we forgive those who trespass against. And then forgive us our trespasses. Just remind you, give us our daily bread. We kind of understand that, right? Daily we need to physically eat, spiritually eat maybe as well. Forgive those who trespass, we forgive those who trespass against us and forgive us our trespasses. In the same couplet, it has the word daily bread. Because by the time I finish this morning, you may not be convinced of this, but you'll certainly hear of this. Repentance is not a one off thing, it is a daily, hourly, and for some people like me who live, you know, perhaps lives are not as good as they could be, almost by minute. Thing. Repentance is every day. Jesus, in the model prayer, he gave his disciples and therefore gave us, right in the middle of the daily peace, encouraged us to have forgiveness for our trespasses or our sins. And that's what we're going to talk about. So if you've got your Bibles with you, and there's a lot of Bible studies today, a lot of Bible readings today, so uh, forgive me if I'm a bit slow moving around my Bible sometimes, but we're going to do a bit of a Bible study on repentance. And you'll see it if you've got Joel chapter 2. There's someone in the church, they're not here today, but I often, they ask me to send the scriptures I'm going to use so they can pre-read them before the service. I'm a relatively new Christian. And this person, I, I texted them Joel too, and they texted back and said, there's no Joel in the Bible. I said, try the index. I was like, it's quite a hard book to find. Joel 2. And let me read these words to you. There's quite a lot of verses here. Joel 2, uh, we're going to start at verse 12. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate. He is slow to anger uh, and abounding in love. He relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings to the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, consecrate the assembly, bring bring the elders and gather the children, those nursing at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep before the temple porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Then the Lord will be jealous for his land. He will take pity on his people. The Lord will reply to them, I'm sending you grain, new wine, and oil, enough to satisfy you fully. Never again will I make you an object of scorn to the nations. I will drive the northern army far from you, pushing it into a parched and barren land with its front columns going into the eastern sea and those in the rear into the western sea and its stench will go up, its smell will rise. Surely he has done great things. 
Be not afraid, O land. Be glad and rejoice. Surely the Lord has done great things. Be not afraid, O wild animals, for the open pastures are becoming green. The trees are bearing fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their riches. Be glad, O people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the autumn rains in righteousness and sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains as before. The threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. Someone here this morning needs to hear that phrase. I will repay you, that's you, for the years the locusts have eaten. The great locusts and the young locusts, the other locusts and the locust swarm, my great army I sent among you. But you will have plenty to eat. Until you are full, you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. And then you will know that I am in Israel. I am the Lord your God. And there will be no other. Never again will my people be shamed. And afterwards, even if that wasn't enough, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see dreams. I turn the page too quick. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I'll pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the coming of the great and the dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone, that's everyone, who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance, said the Lord, among the survivors whom the Lord calls. What an incredible passage. The emotions as Joel expresses as they face as an Israelite nation, this giant army from the north invading their land. As it reminds them to repent and turn back to God. And in that repentance, God will keep his promises. And finally, God will restore. And not just restore, he will give them gifts of the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, it talks about gifts of the Holy Spirit. Young men, old men, all. I love the old men. I'm not sure when an old man thing starts. Is it 40? Is it 50? I think it's around 70 or 80 now because I'm 60. But they will dream dreams. Who wants to dream a dream? Okay, three of us. God could answer your prayer if you showed it. Who wants to see a vision? Who wants to actually see the kingdom of God restored? Then we have to daily repent. Because the Joel scripture is not famous for being in Joel, although obviously it is in Joel. That's a, you understand what I'm trying to say. It's famous because Peter used it on the day of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's his significance. We live in an enlightened world of church where we say the Spirit, and rightly so, is everything. It dominates. It's what we seek and search after. But on the day of the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Peter stood up and went back to Joel. The Word and the Spirit are forever in tandem. And that relationship must never, ever be broken or get out of kilter. Because that relationship is what brings us to restoration and to revival. The definition of the word repentance in the Hebrew part of the Scriptures is two words, shub and niham. And what's behind those words, shub is turn around. And niham is to feel sorrow. Repentance is to turn around. It is to feel sorrow. It is interesting. I could not believe it. I prepare my messages quite a way in advance because I travel so much, so time is a little precious, and I use often my travel time to prepare. I prepared the bones, if you will, or the basics of this message a few weeks ago as I was preparing my last one, actually, both at the same time. A bit weird. So I knew what I was going to speak last Sunday when I was sitting in the congregation And if you remember, Julius stood up at the very end and advertised the week of prayer. Do you remember that? There's going to be a week of prayer in April, and it's all based on Joel chapter 2. I said again, no. This is God, right? And why is that so important? Because the Greek word for repentance, which is used in the New Testament, 
is this, make a choice. So let's combine the Hebrew and the Greek. Let's make a choice to turn around feeling godly sorrow on a daily basis. Why is that important? Because that's what I believe brings revival or restoration. Of course, the Bible is full of big acts of repentance, of turning away. We've seen the the brilliant uh, sort of story that Jesus told of the prodigal son coming home after having wasted all his father's goods and money he realizes feeding the pigs, this was not the right place to be. And he says, I need to go back home and seek my father's forgiveness. And we had the reaction of the older son. How dare he come back here? I always laugh when I tell my granddaughter, particularly the story of Jonah. She doesn't really understand it because I get very excited about the bit of Jonah where Jonah preaches and the city gets saved and he's really irritated. She said to me, but that's good, isn't it, Granddad? I mean, it is good, but Jonah didn't want it. Jonah didn't want them. He wanted curses and and brimstone and fire. He wanted God's punishment. The last thing he wanted was the city to repent. I can imagine Jonah saying, Heavenly Father, why did you answer my prayer? (laughs) Because that's literally what he did. And then he ran away. And eventually in pity, he's under a little tree that's gently shriveling up and dying as God burnt it deliberately in the sun to expose him and say, are you ready, Jonah, now? There's these huge acts of turning away, of turning about, of making choices. What about Peter after he had denied Jesus three times? What about even Saul to Samuel, where actually Saul once had a real blinding revelation of God and his own unworthiness, and actually says these words to Samuel, forgive me, may the Lord forgive me, I have sinned. In fact, in Romans 3 and verse 23, 24, we know, he talks about the fact we have all of sinned, we all need to turn away. That's not quite what I want to talk about today. Salvation is an everyday thing. What did Paul say? Every day I die. Quite a dramatic phrase, isn't it? It wasn't every day I pray, every day I confess, every day I ask for forgiveness. He says, every day I die. And in fact, the original root of the word day is, I put myself to death. It's a self thing, which is really weird in our society. Every day I die. And then goes on, as you'll see in a moment, to describe his repentance. Now, of course... Lissy and Rob and others have shared from the front here that they believe this is a year of turning around. Interesting turn of phrase. This, you probably know, is our 40th year. Did you know that as a church? That's a yes or a no, do you want to practice? This is our 40th year. We're going to celebrate it in the June-July time. Is there another 40th celebration mentioned in the Bible ever? Rhetorical question, my friend, because I'm about to tell you. Do you remember Joshua? I feel so sorry for Joshua. The place had been led by Moses for 40 years plus through the desert. Incredible miracles, incredible difficult times, daily manna, except for the seventh day when they had double manna on the sick to cope with the seventh. Just an amazing thing just saying that. The pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire, the battles. And then Moses passed away and he went to Joshua, the number two. Ever been a number two in life? Does that make sense? You're never number one. You're number two. You're never quite there. You're always number two. And Joshua had been one of those for 40 years, even though he was one of two had come back and said the correct promise of what he'd seen. And Joshua, the number two, before they cross the Jordan and go into to tackle the first city, Jericho, he gathers the people around. And let me just find uh, this for you. One-handed Bible finding is quite hard. So let me just find, if you've got your Bibles with you, try and find for me, please, Joshua uh, chapter 2, sorry, sorry, Joshua 5 and verse 3, my apologies. Joshua 5 and verse 3, it says this. At the time, Lord said to Joshua, make fit knives, he made the flies, and he did all the sort of uh, the the military uh, and the work and everything else. Actually, I've written down the wrong verse. Uh, Give me a second. It might, be, it might be 3 verse 5. It is. Look at that. Transpose. You don't want to talk about 5 verse 3. That's mass circumcision for men. Okay, let's not go. Uh, well, 
I actually feel myself slightly curling up thinking about it. Okay, so look, let's leave that side. That's another message. God is obviously leading someone on that. So that just, just whatever God's saying through that, you go with it, my friend. Uh, don't, don't mention it ever again. And cut this out of the video, please. We're not doing this. Okay. In Joshua 3, much first 5, there's a much more pleasant uh, moment in Joshua's life. Where, after walking around the desert for 40 years, 40 years, they're just about to cross the Jordan. And he says this in Joshua 3 and verse 5. Thank goodness. Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves. Same root word as repentance. Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things amongst you. Our 40th year, repent. Be transformed because God will do amazing things amongst you. I've already said about this incredible act of, uh, here of, of Peter when he stood up after the tongues of fire descended and he quoted from Joel. He turned from the word to the word and talked about repentance and revival. Repentance and revival together. An incredible combination. And let us go back to that Joel chapter 2 and try and bring uh, some of that out. The first thing you see in verses 12 to 32 In this 40th year, think about these words. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. In verse 13 there, he talks about rending our heart and not our garments. Repentance, the call to repent, isn't an outward symbolic thing. It is a deep heart-based choice. It is not about the outward look. It is about the inside. It is about what happens in our heart. I see many Christians going through the motions, doing what should be done, but their heart never changes. And I find this verse exceptionally challenging and very modern. Rend your heart, not your garments. The concept of garments being rent in the, in the Bible and, and in fact in the whole of the, the area and but even today is it's an outward sign of your sorrow. You rent your garments. You put perhaps ashes uh, on your head. You walk around and people know that you are sorrowful. You are mourning perhaps. You're asking for forgiveness perhaps. But you're sort of symbolically doing something. Yet sometimes your heart never changes. And you know that phrase, obedience is better than sacrifice. God wants us to be obedient and to rend our heart in repentance, not our outward looking. In Ezekiel 8 and verse 21, it tells us that we need to break the sin cycle. For some of us sitting here today, and some of us listening uh, when they're watching this recording, you have cycles of sin you cannot get out of. And I'm sure there is a position sometimes or a place for deliverance or a place for counselling. But the biggest thing we should do first is genuinely repent by the rending of our hearts and the cycle will be broken. Ezekiel 8 is absolutely explicit. Because he says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. See, if my mind is continually filled by pornography, my mind needs to be renewed. How is my mind renewed? It's renewed by rending my heart, not my garments. By genuinely turning away. By having a choice. Then my mind is renewed. So therefore, pornography does not need to dominate my mind, as an example. It's gone very quiet now. Circumcision was the first mistake, but now I think we're onto pornography. Perhaps I've made my second mistake. I'm joking. So rend our heart, not our clothes. In Colossians 3, it talks about how we live together. It says, put away lying, put away adultery, put away criticism, put away impatience. It's a physical act of putting away. It doesn't say drift away. It doesn't say wander off from that problem you've got with gossiping. It doesn't say wander off from that problem you have with lying. He says, put away, physically do something. Rend your heart, not your garments. It's a very powerful, when I was younger, we used to call them doing words. Does that make sense? You have to do something. 
In verse 13, he says, in, in Joel 2, he says this, Rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. God is gracious. Do not repent because you're scared of God, because you feel like a victim, because you think he's going to come and get you. He's going to destroy you. We do it because it says here, his goodness, his graciousness, his compassion, his abounding love. In Romans 2 and verse 4, he talks about the fact that God loved us before we were even thought about being created. We read, I was very grateful for the song that came up in confirmation. Jesus tells the story of the shepherd who went after 99 sheep, one sheep. I would have been happy with 99. I'm a pretty average sort of guy. How much effort can I put into the extra sheep? How much is it worth? Jesus left the 99 to find me, to find you. In verse 15 to 16, it says, Blow the trumpet, declare a fast, call on assembly, gather the people, consecrate the assembly, bring the elders, gather the children, those nursing the breast, the bridegroom, leave his chamber, the priests. Do you get the impression? Everybody, would have been shorter to write that, everybody needs to come together for all of us in this church, all of us in this community. We need to understand daily repentance if we want to see restoration and revival. Every day, there is no section of our community that exempts. We need to repent because we desire revival. That's quite a quiet amen there. Perhaps we don't desire revival. I mean, I am nervous if God brings revival here. The mess it will create. The upset it will create. The fact you won't be able to get a seat. We don't have enough communion glasses. Because I'm a very practical man. I worry about things like this. But in my heart, in my passion, I cry out for revival. And then God holds the mirror up and says, you do what I said and I'll turn up. Shall I say it again? I pray for revival. And God turns up with a mirror. Because daily repentance brings restoration, according to Joel. And here we see in verse 12, back to verse 12, it says this, Return to me of your heart with fasting, weeping, and mourning. It's action, fasting. It's mourning, weeping. It's emotion. It's sincere. It's real. It's turning away. It's not passive. We need to hear the call. The second section here of Joel in verse 18 to 27, he talks about God's promises if we do repent. In verse 19, it says this, The Lord will reply to them, I'm sending you grain, new wine and oil, enough to satisfy you. He says it also in verse 22, in fact. He talks about the fact the pastures becoming green, the trees bearing fruit, the fig tree and the vine yielding their riches and so on. God's promise if we repent, not just once, but every day, is to give us grain, new wine, and oil. Do you want the grain, the new wine, and the oil of God? Be careful what you ask for. What does grain signify in the Bible? Of course, it signifies material blessing. What does the oil signify? It signifies a Holy Spirit, but not a passive. The way the word oil is actually described here, it actually is an active thing. You know that woman, when, the, when she came to, I'm off our script now, but when the woman came to the prophet and said, me and my son, the prophet, and my husband has died, me and my son are destitute, and the prophet said to them, go and fill up. What have you got left in your house? She said, uh, a jar of oil. You know the story. You're with me, Hollywood. She goes back to the house, jar of oil. She says to her son, God has said he's going to give us everything we need. He goes, how? The jar of oil. So he brings in, and of course in my head it's a very small jar. It's not a big jar, right? Because otherwise it'll spoil the story. She brings in this little small jar of oil and puts it down. And I can imagine the son going, really? This is a small jar of oil. Because that's what I would say. And you know what happened? The oil kept flowing, so they ran out of every container in their house and every other house in the street, the town, wherever it was. That's the same oil word used here. Just start again. God is going to give us grain, 
the oil that keeps going that fills every single receptacle in your life, your house, your family, your street, your city, your town, your country. I see, appear to be on my own here. That's the oil he's promising here in Joel. Amen. And then the wine. Not any old wine, my friend. Not the rubbish stuff. Yeah. Not the stuff at the beginning of the wedding. The stuff at the end of the wedding. Does that make sense for those who've been here? Oh, well, you know what I'm talking about. I haven't got time to describe it now. The new wine. The posh wine. The top table wine. The wine where the bloke shows it to you first and brushes the, brushes the bottle and makes sure you can read the label and pause it for you to sniff and run around here. That wine. The joy of life. The emotion that goes with it. And you notice in verse 20 here, what is the second promise of God? He removes the threat. He talks about the northern army. But he then describes the locusts of the north. They will be beaten. God, if we repent, will do the same for us. Those continual defeats, that army of habit, of occupation of your life and my life, he will defeat it. That army of the north will be banished because that's his promise. And last but not least here, he will restore and he will revive. In verse 28 to 32, often quoted, he talks about pouring out our spirit on our people, our sons and our daughters, our old men, our young men and so on. And this is what we see in the Acts of the Apostles. By calling and obeying the call to repent, by living through God's promises to repentant people, he can restore and bring about revival. And in the Acts of the Apostles, which is not a story to remind us how good it could be, it's a story with a pattern that reminds us what we could have. It starts with Peter standing up and quoting Joel. Repent. And if you repent... God's promises and God's restoration. In Ezekiel 11 and verse 17 to 20, it talks about the idea that if we turn back, our hearts will be renewed. And God's spirit, it talks about his fruitfulness or we pour it out on us. Who would like this every Sunday, or in fact, every time we meet together, to be the upper room? Who would like to physically see tongues of fire? Now, see, there's some skeptics here now, my friend. Don't put God in a box. Can you imagine if you're praying in a prayer meeting? I don't know about you. I'm very good at closing my eyes for a while. Then I begin to drift. Does that make sense? I'm confessing to you now. This is my repentance moment. Perhaps because I've been trying, I've been traveling too much. I get a little tired. I suddenly find myself jerking very slightly as I realize I may have drifted off. And can you imagine in a prayer meeting, and to keep yourself awake, you open half an eye, and you realize there are tongues of fire on everybody else's head. What's your first reaction? Close your eyes. That's the right answer. Okay, no. <laughs> Let's pretend it never happened, my friend. I think there are tongues of fire on Bayo's head. Let's move on. <laughs> of course you don't. You say, Bayo, you've got a tongue of fire on your head, my friend. He goes, you see your head. That's not a historical occurrence. That is for us. It doesn't say in the Bible, and so therefore, at the Acts, that's the end of the story. Do the best you can. It says that is a pattern of life. But it starts with Joel 2. The upper room started with Joel 2, 700 years before. Repent and confess and be restored by your God. Because if we do that, the upper room is the natural consequence of that repentance. Now, I could go through a whole Ezekiel thing where I was going to, but time is against me. So if you want to know, read Ezekiel 11, you'll see how those things are connected. We want to live as restored, revived people, individually, as families, as a church, but we need to learn to repent. If this is our 40th year, like Joshua, with the Israelites of the 40th year, and that verse in the correct area of Joshua 3 and verse 5 said, and stand back and see God's wonders, isn't that what we want? Of course, the most famous verse of this passage is verse 32. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The single biggest promise in the Bible. Everyone who calls on the Lord 
will be saved. And if you today, like Nina said, just at the end of the worship, do not know Jesus as your saviour, he is saying now through my words to you and through the pricking of your conscience and your mind by the Holy Spirit, step forward because he is ready to save you. Everyone, anyone who calls, prays the name to know God, the Lord, he is Lord, will be saved, promise fulfilled. Those two thieves in Luke 23, when they were nailed on the cross either side of Jesus, the unrepentant thief said, if you're Jesus, save yourself and save me. Go on then, big king of the Jews. And the other thief said, don't do that. This man is innocent. And turning to Jesus in all his pain and his agony in the last few minutes of his life, he repented. And how do we know he repented? He said, remember me this day when you enter the kingdom of God. If you have not found Jesus, do not be the unrepentant thief. Recognize Jesus for who he is and turn to him. But for us who are Christians, what does daily repentance mean? And with these few thoughts, I want to challenge us Every day, in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, it says, every day we confess our sin. Daily repentance is not about punishment. It's not about guilt. It's not about shame. It's not about being a victim. It's not a formulae. It is not a confession that some uh, other churches uh, agree to. You go into a box and you do your tick and you give it all over. It's a positive, life-affirming, life-changing decision to turn around and walk in a deeper relationship with God. It's a constant relationship with God. When John the Baptist said, to the Pharisees and to the people around him, he actually said uh, to them, um, you know, uh, he said, you, you people must be saved. As he got close to Jesus, he was describing Jesus being close. It was a deliberate choice. Look, I don't have time to go through these scriptures. Let me just read them out for those perhaps who watch later. 1 Corinthians 15:31. Every day I must die by dealing with myself. Psalm 1, I deliberately place myself in the place of righteousness. Matthew 3 and uh, and verse 2, who John the Baptist said, Come in after me, someone who I cannot undo their shoes, but I will will call repentance. The proximity to Jesus caused him to bring out repentance. And what's the fruit of daily repentance? In Acts 26 and verse 20, Paul talks about our lives being deeds and being forgiven by God. Matthew 3 and verse 8 talks about our actions because of our salvation. Luke 3 and verse 10 talks about action because of our salvation. Matthew 7 and verse 15 talks about the fruit that comes from repentance. God wants us, as we saw in the Lord's prayer model every day to confess with godly sorrow and repent making a choice daily turning away breaking the cycle for some of us we may need help we may need support we may need people around us but it is our responsibility so today we've done back to basics on daily repentance Revival, of course, has many elements. Prayer, the word, worship, generosity, huge numbers of salvation, hunger, evangelism. But revival has only one subject at its heart. And that core subject is repentance. Everything else is symptomatic. It is an outworking of revival. Repentance is the core We want that wine, that new wine, that oil, that grain, the revival of the land as it describes in Ezekiel. We want what Peter saw in the upper room and the people round about them said, these are not learned men. How can they speak our language? In our 40th year, we want Joshua, a Joshua to say to us, repent and God will do amazing things amongst us isn't that an incredible scripture repent and God will do amazing things amongst us 
For many of you, you do this every day anyway. But for all of us, daily repentance in Joel is the key to many things in our lives that are not as they should be. It is the key to much of our families being unlocked for God. It is the key to our community finding Jesus. It is the key to this church experiencing restoration and revival. And the reason why I've organized for me to preach a little earlier than normal is because I would like us not just to hopefully enjoy and be slightly entertained by this morning's word, but to do something about it now. And what I'd like us to think about, and in a while when I finish, Paul and the group will continue with the worship. I'd like us to think about how do we turn this into action? And there's lots of ways of doing that. And it's not a course about today, it's about tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday and so on. For some of you, perhaps it's just to stand up and just pray and say, God, I need to remind me every day, I need to say, I need to die to self every day, God. And perhaps you just say that this morning. For some of you, you perhaps need to come and, and we have a, the crosses. Oh, the crosses here. Don't worry about the symbolism, but if that helps you, perhaps to kneel to pray. I've asked for the communion to be here. Not that we all take communion, but if, though, by the way, if you all want to take communion, there's nothing wrong with that. But for some of you taking communion may help remind you of the death of Jesus and therefore to repent. Does that make sense? Say so symbolically to help. There is something under here, by the way. This is not just a paper, a, a thing on here. For some of you, you need someone to help you because you are not able to break the cycle of repentance. Then come here and some of us will be around to pray for you. You have to find, I have to find how to make the Lord's prayer come to life. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us as we forgive others. Let's just stop on that one sentence. Forgive us. Lord, I repent. Lord, I confess. Lord, I turn about. Lord, I feel sorrow. Lord, I make a choice because I want the best of the land. I want the blessing. I want the upper room. I need to daily repent. Daily repent. Let's just close our eyes. Let us just stand to our feet as a group if we can. Keep your eyes closed. I'm just going to pray. And over the next half an hour or so, as we get the second half of our worship, if you will, think about it in the theme of repentance. Repentance, says Joel, leads to restoration. Same root word as the word revival. As we're standing here in front of you, Lord, see us as individuals. See us as members of families. We celebrated Mother's Day today. See us as a church. See us as a community affecting Wickford, the Crouch Valley, and beyond. And Jesus, remind us what we have to do to daily repent. And as we go through repentance here, it was appropriate for us and we go into worship, into praise. Remind us tomorrow morning in the dark and the rain and the miserability of, of our Monday morning to repent. And Tuesday to repent. And Wednesday to repent. And Thursday to repent. But here comes the oil. Here comes the grain. Here comes the wine. Friday to repent. Saturday to repent. This is not my words. Joel says, turn away and repent. Just go through, think about what God has been saying to you. Respond or react in the way that you feel to be appropriate as we go through this worship. As I say, you can use the communion, 
You can just come forward and kneel or kneel where you are, pray where you are. There's no formula here. But make it deep. Rend your heart, not your garments. Ask someone else to pray for you. Come forward here for prayer, particularly if you can't break those cycles that you've tried to repent of. And it just comes back again within minutes, hours or days. God wants a repentant people. Amen.